Uh, I would like to begin with thanking the organizers, and particularly Martin, for giving this opportunity to present some of the work here. I have enjoyed this meeting so far, so thanks so much for putting together an exciting meeting. In particular, I'm grateful because I get to hear all those people whose work actually inspired me as an undergrad and a master's student to do systems biology. Uh, Ganesh, Chetan, Karthik, Narendra, these are people I've heard seven, eight years ago when I was an undergrad and master's student. And today I'm going to talk about some of the work I've done since as a PhD student and then as a postdoc, and some of the questions which we are now beginning to uh, try to address in the lab in our group that just started only six months ago at IASC. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is how to apply some of the ideas which already heard during the day and during the meeting of systems biology to try to understand this phenomena of cancer metastasis. So cancer, as many of you know, is called as this emperor of all melodies. It, it, it's a disease which you know, sends shiver down our spine. We perhaps know someone or the other being afflicted by this disease. What exactly is cancer is an uncontrolled growth of abnormal cells. So what you see in this picture is the normal organ, liver in this case, being somehow changed by these speckles of cells which are cancer cells. So when every cell in our body has this ability to divide, and then it stops dividing after a finite number of divisions. But what cancer cells continue to divide, and therefore they change the function as well as the form of a specific organ, and that's why most cancer patients die of multiple organ failure. Now, the journey of a cancer cell begins in a specific organ, when, and then, as shown in green cell here, then it continues to divide much faster, trying to take up a larger chunk of the organ. But then it no longer remains restricted. It also tries to spread to different organs of the body. And once it spreads, it also tries to form colonies at those organs. And this process is what is called as metastasis. Now, the numbers here can be different uh, for different cancers, but what I'm trying to emphasize is the acceleration that happens once cancer actually starts to spread. Over the past 60, 70 years, uh, we have made some fantastic progress in diagnosing cancer early. So now there are tests uh, specifically, for instance, for breast cancer and prostate cancer that people can get their, uh, then check themselves and try to identify the risk of getting cancer. Um, of course, gaining a more molecular understanding of what genes are involved in accelerating or deaccelerating cancer progression, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes, and identifying risk factor, lifestyle factors such as smoking causes lung cancer. But what we have not been able to do is actually try to understand or try to have a breakthrough in restricting metastasis, because all these progress restricts itself to the initial stages. Once a cancer spreads, we have not yet been able to identify how to stop it from spreading further and further. And this process of metastasis is the major cause of all cancer-related deaths. 90% of cancer patients who die, die because of metastasis. So if we can stop metastasis, we can actually have a huge impact in terms of the lives of patients as well as the biomedical research. And how cancer spreads, as shown in this picture, is using this fantastic set of freeways in our body, which is the setup of blood vessels. So cancer cells in one organ get on the blood vessels near them, travel to all different parts of the body, take different exits at different organs, and start forming tumors at, at those organs. Now, when I started looking into this question, what was most intriguing to me was that actually more than 80% of cancers happen in epithelial organs. So if you think of the most common cancers that we hear about, uh, say prostate cancer, breast cancer, lung cancer, liver cancer, these cancer cells do not have the inherent property to start moving because they are stuck in a specific 3D geometry with, tightly with their neighbors in a specific epicobasal polarity and so on and so forth. So how do, this, how do these cells gain the ability to move? How do these cells gain the ability to survive in circulation and then form a whole new tumor at a different organ is what I'm trying to understand. Now, it might be surprising to you, but actually metastasis is a highly inefficient process. 99.9% .9 of cells which leave the primary tumor or the home organ don't form metastasis. It's only those small 0.1% of cells, or maybe even less than them, that, that are actually able to form metastasis. Because metastasis is a very dynamic process. It requires changes in, at different space and time locations in multiple features, such as the cells have to be able to change their strong cell cell adhesion with their neighbors, which they had in the first place. And then they have to regain the ability to be able to uh, proliferate and also tie strong bonds with their neighbors when they reach a distant organ. 
they also have to gain the ability to migrate and invade, and then they have to lose the ability to migrate and invade later. They have to evade attacks by the immune system. They have to settle down on a completely new organ and colonize it. And of course, they have to be able to resist all these different therapies that are being constantly given to the patient. So how do we understand this such a complicated dynamic process of metastasis using some of the mathematical modeling ideas is what I'm going to talk about. Now, one way to think about this process is how cancer biologists have thought about cancer for a very long period of time, which is mutations, which are basically irreversible genetic changes which are completely heritable. So once the DNA sequence changes, it cannot be reversed. It just continues. But as you just saw, metastasis requires a very dynamic adaptability, a plasticity. Again, going back to what Ganesh was talking about, phenotypic plasticity of switching back and forth. At some time, they have to gain a feature. At the other time, they have to lose a feature. And it has the same cell which has to do it. Otherwise, it will not be able to form metastasis. So therefore, not, it is not surprising that so far, there is no unique mutational signature that has been identified for metastasis. Mutational signatures have been identified for multiple other hallmarks of cancer, but not for metastasis. Um, and this is just one example which shows that um, cells can actually become metastatically competent by just being uh, exposed to a new chemical environment. There's literature, I'll just take you to antibiotic resistance problem for a minute, because there's similar literature there. So what these experiments have shown over a period of time is that if you take a bacterial population and treat them with either increasing dosage or for uh, larger periods of time of the antibiotic, what you see is that a large number of cells die and then a few number of cells survive. Now if you take that few small number of cells, regrow the population, redo the experiment, you again see the same trend. And you continue to see the same trend across generations. Now, if this, if this was due to mutations, or necessarily solely mutations, then what you would have seen is more of a flat line. Because these cells are genetically, now they have developed a way to avoid drugs forever. And that is what they pass on to their generations. But unfortunately, that's not what happens as uh, seen in these experiments. So then people have done detailed molecular experiments and actually identified that the, this phenomena, so-called persistence, is basically an example of phenotypic switching. So cells have two phenotypes, one in which they are sensitive to the same drug, the other in which they are resistant to the same drug, and they can go back and forth. So the same cell can be sensitive at one time point, resistant at the another time point. And similar literature has appeared in cancer. That is why you see these titles like reversible drug resistance. And also um, Narendra, who gave a talk earlier this week, has observed this phenomena in the case of viral populations. So this, pop this idea of phenotypic plasticity leading to drug resistance has been seen in bacterial, viral, and now in cancer populations. So all, again, going, going back to uh, Ganesh's talk, all we need to do to understand phenotypic switching is to identify a network, right? So biologists, of course, have been doing this um, cartoon figures of trying to identify a network for a very long period of time. This is a picture taken from one of the most well-cited reviews in the field of cancer called the Hallmarks of Cancer. And they have presented this, what they call, integrated circuit. And according to them, the biologists, uh, perhaps this figure is sufficient to understand cancer, but maybe for some of us in the audience who think about things in a more quantitative way, just this picture alone is not necessarily complete. What we need is more about in terms of the time scale, strength of regulation, direct, indirect, and all these features. So that is why perhaps we have not been able to make such a huge impact in the clinic, despite these circuits being having worked out by the molecular biologists in the field of cancer. This is um, the last sentence of the re this particular review that I was talking about which says that one day we imagine that cancer biology will become a science and that has a logical coherence that rivals that of chemistry or physics. Ten years later, when they rewrote this review called Hallmarks of Cancer, the next generation, added four more features, and again, they end with this frustration that still cancer research is sort of far away from being a logical science, and we are far away from identifying underlying organizing principles, as we have done in other systems, as you heard about in this conference itself. So again, I'm not going to talk in a more detail, but you know, a systems approach, uh, this is an engineered system where there are multiple feedback loops involved. You have a design system manual that is available. You know how to 
fix the system if it gets broken. There are multiple um, sort of redundancy mechanisms. But in biological systems, first of all, there's no design manual available. We don't know why the system is the way it is. We don't know why it functions, why this particular network was chosen by evolution over the other particular network. And of course, as um, Karthik pointed out in response to the question, we are constantly figuring out new networks itself. So that changes our uh, perception of how things are connected to each other. So can we take a similar approach of identifying these networks, looking at their dynamics, and connect that to metastasis? So again, just making clear what I'm not going to talk about. This is not a bioinformatics talk. I'm not going to infer networks, nor this is a cancer biology talk of a particular type of cancer. What I'm trying to do is to look at a more generic picture of what uh, networks allow this phenotypic plasticity, which are seen across different cancers and identify some of those underlying organizing principles per se. So the idea in the field had been the following, that as I mentioned, there are these epithelial cells in our body which have this property to adhere tightly to their neighbors, and they do not typically migrate or invade. And then there are these mesenchymal cells in our body which are exactly opposite. They do not adhere to their neighbors, such as red blood cells, for example, and they have this ability to migrate and invade. So how metastasis happens, one of the um, main underlying hypotheses is that cells undergo this transition when they gain some of these properties of migrating and invading and lose the property of adhesion, and this phenomenon is called as epithelial to mesenchymal transition, or EMT in short. And that is when they actually breach the basement membrane and get on the freeway. On the other hand, when they reach a distant organ, they undergo the exact opposite transition called MET, mesenchymal to epithelial transition, because now they no longer need to migrate or invade, now they need to settle down. So this EMT and MET continues and continues to form metastasis. But what was seen in papers later was that cancer cells can actually also leave the tumor as a cluster as a unit of cells, not necessarily as a single cell, because this EMT-MET paradigm is about single cell migration per se. But how do we explain this clustered migration? And why does it matter? Because clusters are the one which actually form the most metastasis. So if you look at the total number of CTCs, circulating tumor cells, only 2% of CTCs are clusters, and those 2% of clusters form 98% of metastasis. So there's a disproportionately high contribution of clusters to form metastasis. So we need to understand how these clusters are formed and how do these clusters fit into this binary paradigm of EMT and MET per se. These are again snapshots of reviews of EMT and MET over a period of 10 years. And all you can see is, well, all I'm trying to highlight is that the clustered migration or collective migration is not really mentioned as an end point. The end point has always been thought of as this single cell migration. So the question we began with, with was that, can we explain clustered cell migration? What is the phenotype of that? What is the molecular uh, mechanism underlying that setup? So what we did was look at, start with a network, which is um, known to report, which, is, uh, which was reported to regulate EMT across different cancers. Here in this network, there are two transcription factors which drive a more mesenchymal phenotype. And there are these two microRNAs which drive a more epithelial phenotype. The numbers here represent some sort of input-output relationship, some sort of strength of uh, interaction as experimentally identified. Dotted lines represent the microRNA-mediated regulation because now this is happening at a translation level. And the solid lines represent transcription regulation. Now, these kind of networks have actually been seen in many other setups. For instance, you know, the first circuit which was uh, built synthetically was this one, where two transcription factors inhibit each other. And it is well understood that these kinds of networks can give rise to what is known as bistability, which is that you have two different phenotypes available. In this particular setup, what happens is that you get, you can draw these null clines, you can draw these curves, there are three intersections, you can do stability analysis, one ends up being unstable, two end up being stable, and the two that end up being stable are these ones. When A is high, B is low, and when A is low, B is high. So, you know, now if you, from this perspective, if you look at the network I just talked about, you can easily understand that mesenchymal is when those two proteins are high and the microRNAs are off, and epithelial is when those microRNAs are on and the, those transcription factors are off. Again, still a binary picture. We have not yet understood how collective migration comes into picture. There are typical equations one can write, typical analysis one can do, and so on and so forth. So what we did was that 
This was well understood for transcription factor networks. We wanted to understand how a microRNA mediated network be, might be behaving differently than a transcription factor one. So we had this generic framework, whereas one or more microRNAs can bind reversibly to this mRNA, forming these complexes, which can either sequester the mRNA for the time being and later release it, so that is translational inhibition, or actively degrade both the mRNA and the microRNA itself. Now, you can write on a set of coupled ODEs, as I was showing in the previous slide, where you have terms for uh, production, terms for degradation, terms for uh, microRNA-mediated regulation, and similar nonlinear terms for transcriptional regulation. So you can do all of this analysis, and what we found actually that our network was more than bistable. This network was potentially tristable. So what you see here is that x-axis can be thought of as some EMT-inducing signal, and the y-axis is the measure of EMT-ness. The solid lines show stable states, and the dotted lines show unstable states, and this is what is called a bifurcation diagram for men for whom you are aware of nonlinear dynamics and details. So what we see here is that, of course, there's an epithelial phenotype which corresponds to very low levels of ZEB. There is a mesenchymal phenotype which corresponds to very high levels of ZEB. And then in between that, there's another possible steady state which is available of the system which has the ZEB levels correspond, which are intermediate as that of co compared to epithelial and mesenchymal. We called this one a hybrid epithelial mesenchymal phenotype and the way we interpreted this was that this has the ability to both adhere and migrate, sort of integrate the properties of epithelial and mesenchymal nature and potentially give rise to this uh, collective cell migration. The other feature that you see in this uh, graph is the following. Now, that there are monostable regions. Now, so if you look at this region and draw a vertical line upwards, there's only one solid blue line that you would cross here, which corresponds to epithelial. So in this parameter regime, the only phenotype available is epithelial. In this parameter regime, the only phenotype available is mesenchymal. But of course, you have regions in which there is more than one phenotype that is available, which means that if you were to take a genetically identical population, still you can see different phenotypes. So again, mutation is not necessarily the only way to think about in terms of uh, metastasis. That's all good, uh, but is there any experimental proof for all of this? So we collaborated with a group at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, these are non-small cell lung cancer cells, and we stained them for an epithelial protein shown in uh, red, E. cadherin, and a mesenchymal protein, vimentin, labeled in green. What you see here is that single cells actually have both red and green proteins. So, which means that single cells in the cell line are perhaps in this hybrid state. But again, this is one snapshot. So in order to check whether this was a stable phenotype or not, we just cultured that cell line over multiple passages. And when we observed them after two months, we saw the same behavior, that still most cells were staining both for red and green, suggesting that this can be a hybrid phenotype uh, present in this particular experimental model system. We did another uh, set of experiments. So these are epithelial cells, mesenchymal cells, and these hybrid cells that I just showed you. The levels of ZEB, as we had predicted in the bifurcation diagram, absent in epithelial, very high in mesenchymal, intermediate in hybrid. And again, you can look at ecaterin, shows the exact opposite trend, highest in epithelial, least in mesenchymal, but still present in these hybrid cells. Another experiment we did, this is um, scratch assays. What happens in this, what you do in this experiment is basically grow cells and then take a needle and make a, make a scratch. And then you see how cells uh, move to fill in that wound. These are mesenchymal cells. They are basically flying out as single cells. These are hybrid cells. They are moving much more collectively, forming this, again, uh, collective migration, cluster migration uh, type phenotype. The other prediction we had was that even in genetically identical population, one should be able to see this non-genetic, -gen non non-genomic heterogeneity, phenotypic heterogeneity, whatever you want to call it. After we made this prediction, there were people who actually started looking into this idea across different cancers. So for instance, this is breast cancer cell line sorted for uh, an epithelial and a mesenchymal protein. These are you know, flow cytometry experiments where you look for every single cell and see if that cell has protein one, protein two, or both of those. So again, you see there are cells which have only one of these proteins, and then there are cells which have both of these proteins. Uh, these are lung cancer cell lines. They were, look, they were stained for various other combinations of epithelial and mesenchymal markers. You still see the same behavior. Uh, we did this experiment in colorectal cancer, prostate cancer, uh, and also lung cancer. You again see the same behavior, that this non-genetic heterogeneity was present across different cancers. 
Um, once we started looking into EMT, once we started modeling EMT, there, was a, there's, there has been a surge of people modeling EMT. They're using all different types of modeling methods. They're using all different networks. And uh, what general prediction, which is common across all those models, is that EMT is not binary. There are one or more states. Um, depending on the network, each of them has a different molecular signature for hybrid. We still need to reach some convergence on that. But one thing which we have reached a convergence on, it, it's, it's not a binary state per se. And what um, the student Kishore, uh, together with the summer students Burhan and Vishnu, what we are working on is look at all these networks and try to model them using different frameworks and see, is there something specific about the topology itself that we can say uh, from here? So that's all, this is the same diagram that I showed you, um, the whole good and fine, there was some basic experimental validation. But one thing which we were very surprised by was that in this bifurcation diagram, there is no region in which the only phenotype is hybrid. Hybrid is always coexisting with others. There are regions of monostable epithelial and mesenchymal, but the experiment that I showed you, most cells were actually hybrid. So then how do we explain this phenomenon? This is again, you know, the feedback loop between math and biology and trying to we had an observation which validated our experiments, but uh, our predictions, but then gave us some, a new question. So then I went to uh, developmental biology literature because EMT is not necessarily something which is invented by cancer cells. EMT also happens during development of various organs and try to identify what is known to regulate collective behavior there. So I'm just showing one example. By adding one more node in the network, you see that the diagram changes, and now you have a region in which the only phenotype is hybrid. So suggesting that this particular, this particular factor might be stabilizing a hybrid phenotype, and that's what we call its a phenotypic stability factor. It's not inducing a phenotype. It's just expanding the range of parameters under which you can observe it. We have identified various other stability factors for which experimental evidence has been gained. I'll show you just one example here. These are the same cells, H1975, which are stably hybrid. You delete this particular factor or a similar other factor. You see that the collective migration gets disrupted. Cells begin to move more as single cells, and they lose all of their ecoderm. They basically go to being completely mesenchymal. So these cells, which were stably hybrid for two months, uh, based on a perturbation done, uh, predicted by a model, were able to switch their phenotype within 18 hours both at a molecular level and at a functional level. So they, they lost the cell cell adhesion and that's why they were undergoing a sort of single cell kind of behavior. So the other prediction we had was that now in a multi-stable system where multiple phenotypes are possible, cells can actually switch back and forth because there is enough noise, there is enough biological noise. So this experiment was done where they sorted cells for um, again, an epithelial and a mesenchymal protein. And then once they had these segregated populations, they cultured them independently. What you see is that when you start with only epithelial or only mesenchymal, after a period of two weeks, they mostly maintain their phenotype. But the hybrid ones, which is co-expressing these two markers, actually is no longer able to maintain itself and quickly gives rises to epithelial or mesenchymal. So, Depending on the initial condition, you can have different distributions of these phenotypes. So we had this question, can we explain this sort of population dynamics? So we start with the network that I talked to you about, and then consider that during cell division, there is some bare minimum asymmetric division of molecules that is happening. Because during cell division, it has been shown for multiple molecules that they can be completely asymmetrically divided, which means that one daughter cell gets a lot of it, and the other daughter cell doesn't get anything. So what we said was that now, at every cell division, let's say there is some noise in terms of partitioning of molecules and see if we can get this feature. And yes, we do, both in terms of time as well as in terms of the percentage that I showed you, our predictions, model predictions were largely able to match what was experimentally observed. Now, EMT has to be reversible because cells have to be able to now undergo MET. So the question we asked is, is EMT always reversible? Or is there some hysteresis in the system? Is there some memory that if you induce the cells for a very, very long period of time, they just somehow lose the ability to come back? Or at least a part of them lose the ability. So this is a simulation we did. The, uh, the bottom axis shows the increasing strength of the EMT-inducing signal, and the top axis shows the reducing strength of that. What you see is, again, there is this hysteresis. There is memory in the system. 
the way they come, they go, within 10 days all of them switch, but when you again withdraw the signal, they don't come back. Actually, one of our collaborators did this experiment. So now, in single cells, they have a reporter system which has both a red and a green protein. Red is connected to an epithelial one, and green is connected to a mesenchymal one. So in the single cell, you can actually see how these dynamics is happening. And we see the same thing, that if you induce EMT for three days, six days, nine days, they come back. If you induce it for, say, 15 days in this experimental system, in this cell line, they don't come back. At least for the amount of time we, we waited. We can wait for longer periods of time and maybe things can change, but that's so far. So again, you know, there is some understanding to gain from looking at this dynamics, because cells may get locked in a mesenchymal state, and once they get locked, due to epigenetic factors or various other things, they lose the ability to switch back to epithelial, then again, they won't form metastasis because they have lost that ability to switch. So connecting on that theme, there is this literature on the ability of EMT cells to form tumors because EMT allows you the ability to move, but then you also have these cells need to have the ability to form tumors there, settle down and so on, which is something similar to what stem cells do. That is, they give rise to all different types in the body. So what the literature suggested was, this is the first paper in the field, that how EMT alters stemness is that when cells undergo EMT, their stemness increases, which is shown graphically here that this is the EMT axis. The left-hand side is epithelial, the right-hand side is mesenchymal, and the stemness window lies somewhere to the right. Three years later, there was a paper which said the exact opposite thing, that EMT decreases stemness. And another year later, there was a paper that said that EMT has no correlation to stemness. There are epithelial stem cells and there are mesenchymal stem cells. Again, not surprising, particularly in the field of cancer literature. What we did was, again, try to look at a similar network-based approach, look at what regulates stemness, what regulates EMT, how they connect to each other. What our model pre predicted was that actually the stemness window is most likely to be stationed somewhere in between. It could move left or right, so we are not excluding the possibility of epithelial stem cells or mesenchymal stem cells, but most likely it was somewhere here. Now, how does this explain all this confusing literature is that all these papers are from an era when EMT was still thought to be binary. So the true hybrid cells were being miscategorized as either epithelial or mesenchymal because there was no concept of trying to identify stably hybrid cells. And the reason I can say that thing with much confidence is because when people started categorizing them into three, you can see the results. That these are in vitro experiments where cells which co-express epithelial and mesenchymal markers form 10 times more tumors as compared to the only epithelial or only mesenchymal ones. These are in vivo experiments showing the same thing in, in mice. There were papers uh, earlier this year from the same groups which I've been talking about, and I, they sort of conclude that acquisition of a hybrid phenotype is essential for forming any tumors, per se. So here, we didn't have any direct experimental collaborator, but we did put out an idea in the field, which was fortunately taken up by a couple of people, and they established that, yes, perhaps this is the most likely scenario that is happening. There's a paper in Nature earlier uh, this year, which actually validated multiple predictions that we have had. First of all, they showed there are multiple states uh, during EMT. They also showed if you start with one state, you can uh, give rise to all different kinds of states, so spontaneous switching due to biological noise. And they showed that these are the ones which are actually most metastatic, not the ones which are completely epithelial, not the ones which are completely mesenchymal, but the ones which are somewhere in between. Now, again, we get back to the question, how do cells form clusters? So far, we have only looked at intracellular circuits. How does a cell have the ability to both adhere and migrate? But if such hybrid cells are randomly segregated in space, they will not form clusters. For them to form clusters, these cells have to be physically close to each other to form a cluster and then break off as a unit. So how does that phenomena happen is what we were interested in studying. And one of the features we thought we'd look at is cell-cell signaling. So the EMT in cell one can influence the EMT behavior of its neighbors. And the um, signaling pathway that we studied here is another well-characterized pathway called as notch signaling pathway. So how notch signaling pathway operates is this is a cell shown by dot, the boundaries of dotted lines. This is another cell. Notch, delta, and jagged are all transmembrane proteins. Notch binds to delta or jagged, and that leads to a cleavage of notch, 
which not intracellular domain goes in the nucleus and activates or represses a whole bunch of genes. There's complicated uh, network here I'm not going into details of. All I want you to uh, notice is that not signaling activates CMT and microRNAs inhibit not signaling. There's bidirectional crosstalk between the EMT signaling and the not signaling. So what we did was we simulated two different conditions. One in which the production rate of delta is much higher other in which the production rate of jagged is much higher. These are the two different ligands that not signaling can get operated by. And in each of these cells, in this layer of 50 cross 50 cells, this is the network that has been put in. We start with different initial random, uh, different random initial conditions and try to identify what kind of spatial patterns can be seen as the system evolves. So what you see is that in case when the production of jagged is much higher, you tend to see these hybrid cells are right next to each other. But in the cases when the production rate of delta is much higher, there is no such pattern that is seen. Suggesting that maybe notch jagged signaling might be the one which is enabling the formation of these clusters, which is enabling these hybrid cells to literally induce their phenotype in the neighbors and then form a cluster. So we looked at clinical data. The top row is patient uh, clusters of CTCs. The bottom row is single CTCs. And you see that the levels of jagged are much higher in clusters as compared to that in single cells. Now, when you look at cells which have the highest level of jagged as shown by this color bar, those cells actually have both various epithelial as well as mesenchymal markers, the same cells, suggesting that jagged is higher in clusters and high jagged cells are more likely to be in this hybrid phenotype per se. But again, this is still uh, correlative data. There is no cause and effect as we have shown here, as we sh saw in the previous experiments where by deleting GRHL2, we were able to push them to being completely mesenchymal. But we did those experiments too. We deleted jagged one. What you see is the proliferation is not affected. Viability is not affected. So the number of cells are still the same but they are not able to form tumors, or the area formed of tumors formed or emboli formed is much smaller. So this again suggests, points towards a functional role of jagged in being able to form tumors. Because jagged sort of helps maintain those hybrid cells and the features of stemness, once you delete jagged, that network gets disrupted and perhaps you lose some of these properties. So this is good basic science going back and forth, but is there any clinical relevance to whatever I just talked about? So this is data taken from um, primary tumor biopsies of different uh, types of breast cancer. TN uh, stands for triple negative, which is the most aggressive form of breast cancer. And the y-axis is showing you the number of such hybrid cells which co-stay in for epithelial and mesenchymal markers. What you see is that the triple negative has the maximum number of such dual positive cells, suggesting some correlation between how aggressive a cancer is and how many number of hybrid cells might be present in that particular tumor. This is... Uh, Typical clinical analysis, kaplan meier analysis. What you, the x-axis is time, the y-axis is the probability of survival of a given patient without seeing a tumor progression. We took these 1,000 patients, clubbed them into two levels based on the median levels of uh, GRHL2, which is a stability factor that I talked earlier about. Patients with high levels of such stability factors have a poorer survival. So suggesting that if a hybrid phenotype is stable, it is likely to be more aggressive per se. This goes against the typical EMT binary idea that the more the EMT, the worse it is. What we are saying is that um, higher probability of being in a hybrid phenotype might actually be worse than those being in a completely mesenchymal phenotype because low levels of GRHL2 as shown by the black curve are completely mesenchymal ones. Then there were papers from pathologists. Um, what they did was a 3D reconstruction of multiple 2D slices. And what they concluded was that single cell migration is extremely rare, if at all, in any cancer. So, so far we have been thinking about this as a very single cell migration problem, but if you look at actual tumors, they don't migrate like that. They migrate predominantly collectively. And these collectively migrating cells had ZEB1 and had e cadherin, the two molecules that we had started out with. Uh, one as epithelial and the other as a mesenchymal marker, suggesting that a hybrid phenotype may be actually more aggressive than a complete uh, EMT phenotype. So our uh, way of thinking is that hybrid phenotype might actually be the fittest for metastasis because epithelial cells or mesenchymal cells have one or the other roadblock in terms of metastasis. Epithelial cells might not have that active uh, ability to migrate, 
whereas mesenchymal cells um, might not have that ability to completely switch their phenotype to being epithelial. But these ones, which are somewhere in between, have the maximum plasticity possible, are able to form clusters, are more stem-like, are more tumor-initiating, as I just talked about, put together, maybe these are the ones which we should really try to target in the clinic. So in terms of just concluding here, um, the existing framework, as I mentioned, had been that the hybrid state is transient. Um, the final outcome is always a single cell migration. And the more the EMT, the more the, aggressive, uh, the more aggressive the cancer is. What we proposed was that hybrid phenotype can be stable and maybe even more aggressive than a complete EMT phenotype. This idea is catching up in the literature. These are just snapshots of reviews which have been written after we have published our work. And they do uh, take cognizance of these ideas of stability factor and that the hybrid phenotype is actually best positioned to have these stem-like properties or have these tumor initiating properties uh, per se. Now, still there are many, many open questions, some of which we are trying to tackle um, now in, in our group. So there were papers three years ago which said that EMT is not necessary for metastasis in the first place. <laughs> Now the way these, the, I'll tell you the experiment that was done. They, we basically take mice and you delete a specific transcription factor from that mice. And you look at number of metastases formed and compare it to the control case where none of these transcription factors was deleted. And in this particular case, they observed that deletion of that transcription factor did not significantly reduce the number of metastases formed. So the conclusion, the way I look at it is that this transcription factor is not necessarily for EMT. The conclusion that was made was that EMT is not necessary for metastasis because it had to go to nature. So of course, you need to have you know a much uh, more controversial topic per se. Um, again, not to their fault. This is the same way in which EMT was shown to be important to metastasis. You overexpress a transcription factor, you see more metastasis. And instead of saying that this transcription factor is important for metastasis, it was claimed that EMT is important for metastasis. So again, you know, basically, if you look at EMT as a highly nonlinear process with multiple changes that have to happen to cells in terms of adhesion, in terms of polarity, uh, in terms of basement membrane remodeling, and so on. So different transcription factors might be pushing different cells to different extents on these different axes. So EMT induced by transcription factor one might be completely different from EMT induced by transcription factor two. So we need to better understand how these networks, I started with a very generic network, but how these networks are specific to different transcription factors, specific to different cancer types, specific to different mouse models, and then you know, say a more context dependent um, definition of EMT and what really is EMT and what isn't EMT. So it's a multidimensional process and again, um, I showed very preliminary experiments on these hybrid cells doing collective cell migration, but still the genetics and biophysics, that connection uh, in terms of EMT uh, still remains to be identified. In, uh, that, that's an open question. Again, um, coming back to where I started, that the cells which undergo metastasis have to coordinate various different properties. They have to be able to change their cell cell adhesion. They have to be able to change their migration and so on and so forth. So here is a simple question that if a box contains, say, six white balls, three red balls, and three blue balls, in how many way can you pick one white, one red, and one blue ball? So these are independent experiments. Six C1 times three C1 times three C1, easy question. How does this relate to metastasis is the following, that there are six or more EMT states, there are three or more stemness states. People have shown that there are three or more metabolic states. So how do cells coordinate these states? Is it completely random that everything can be associated with everything poss else possible? Because if I add the immune states and so on and so forth, this number will just continue to grow exponentially uh, very fast. Or are there some connections between them that change in property one is somehow connected to change in property two? And if yes, then can we try to identify that connection, that correlation uh, using networks, using looking at the topology of networks, how things are connected, what states are more likely to be possible? And again, look at the single cell kind of data that Vinod was talking about and see, is there more prevalence of a few states as compared to others? And if yes, then are there reasons for that? 
do the prevalence of those states change as a function of grade of tumor, stage of tumor, age of patient, so on and so forth. Can we all try to put together in a specific uh, mechanistic framework to understand why that heterogeneity exists? Heterogeneity exists, we all agree. Uh, but where does that heterogeneity come from and what is the role? Why cannot tumor survive with a uh, homogeneous solution? Why do they need to have different cell types? Maybe because they are cooperating in one way or the other? Who knows? There's a lot of complexity going on within a cell and also at a population level. And I believe that you know we, we have the right set of tools that are available and the right sort of framework that we can look at this problem, at this clinical menace, and hopefully try to identify some new uh, therapeutic interventions. With that, I would like to thank the fantastic set of people I've had the fortune to work with. I've highlighted the people whose work I actually, uh, together work, I presented in this uh, today. And overall, this framework of sort of iterative framework, where you start with some data, make some networks, and continue this input test refine and continue to improve your model, get as close to reality as possible, is something um, which I think we should really look at. Uh, I'd like to thank the funding agency and thank you once again for all your attention. Thank you.